Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. A number of years ago, Sam Harris gave a talk on making a scientific morality and what science has to do with morality and how it can inform morality. And it's an interesting talk. Ultimately, Harris fails, but for interesting reasons. And I respect him for asking the question and trying to seriously address it. So I'm going to look at his talk. Uh, but it's his talk is long, and my comments on it are obviously, you know, making it even longer. And so I'm going to do it in parts. So this is part one, where I look at just his introduction. It's a, an honor to be here. Uh, I've never actually even been to Oxford before, let alone spoken here. And uh, needless to say, it's a great honor to be on the stage with uh, my friend and colleague and actually one of my intellectual heroes, Richard Dawkins. That doesn't speak well of you, Sam. So, as many of you know, we have spent the last several years publicly criticizing religion, and I can tell you that what you, you hear back when you do that are all the reasons why most people think that's a terrible thing to do. And the reasons are not so numerous. It turns out there's not a hundred ways or reasons to rise to the defense of God. There really are only three. Either you argue that a specific religion is true, or you argue religion is useful in general, or you argue that atheism is, is intolerant or in bad taste or, or corrosive of something that's important. I'd like to note that stated at that level of generality, that's going to be true of literally pretty much everything. Either it is true or it is useful or the thing that people are doing is bad, you know, antagonistic to it. And that's true whether you're talking about a, a scientific theory or religion or a type of, you know, the, the, you know, bicycles or how to go fishing or anything, pretty much. Um, they, they can be true and has some practical value to it, so, um, or practical implications at the very least. So, I mean, that, that's kind of true of most everything. But, you know, it's a reasonable way of, of dicing things up in order to look at them. Human life. And it's interesting that people rarely argue for the truth of religion. Even fundamentalists, I find. Fundamentalists... Uh, almost never come forward with evidence for miracles or the confirmation of biblical prophecy. Some do, but for the most part, that's not even their primary concern. This is remarkably backwards, incidentally, to be surprised that even fundamentalists don't. Uh, he may not be using a good definition of fundamentalist, but in general, the fundamentalists are the people who are most concerned with the practical effects of religion on culture. And in fact, many of them seem like they're frankly pagans with somewhere between about two and four gods in their pantheon, little g gods, depending on how you want to count the Holy Spirit and Satan or how they kind of do, where really their, their primary concern, I've talked about this in a previous video about fundamentalists, but uh, where their primary concern is entirely cultural. So fundamentalists are the people I would least expect to talk about the truth of religion. Now, on the flip side, I'm not sure what he expects. I mean, does he really expect someone to come up to him after a talk and launch into many hours of argument with him? It, it doesn't lend itself well to you know, in that sort of environment, you know, this sort of environment of, of where you don't have access to research materials, because to, to make points about, you know, in proper apologetics, to make points about things like, you know, how things are attested in ancient documents. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that you have to be able to then go and look up. You need lots of time for this sort of thing. That said, there are an unbelievably large number of resources. If you want proper apologetics, you know, into the, the historical claims of Christianity and so on. Um, I, I can't speak so much to other religions. I'm less familiar there. But especially in Christianity, in the West, where Sam Harris lives, and this is most of who he's talking about, there is an incredibly large amount of material arguing for the truth of Christianity on historical terms and philosophical terms and so on. And so the idea that a person would go and retread all of that impromptu is a little bit strange in the same way that if somebody, you know, if a fundamentalist were to walk, and by the way, just since, since uh, people may not know who the heck I am, um, I think the theory of evolution, I'm Catholic. I think the theory of evolution is a perfectly good scientific theory. Um, may well entirely be how speciation occurred uh, according to God's plan. Anyway, so, um, you know, obviously I don't subscribe to the creation myth of, um, of uh, the, the atheist creation myth that's called evolution, but the scientific theory I have 
no problems with whatsoever. You know, relating to the phylogenic tree and speciation and you know, the time scales of it and so on. All perfectly fine with that. So if a fundamentalist were to come up to Sam Harris and demand Sam Harris prove that evolution is true, Sam Harris would not just start launching into proving that evolution is true. He couldn't because you need things like fossils and genetic studies. All of this stuff takes time and is, you know, most easily done by referencing material already done, to, to reference studies already done, to ref reference fossils already dug up. So, I mean, it's not like an atheist is going to launch into actually proving evolution if you were to just, you know, talk to them, you know, after a talk either. They would go and reference the, you know, careful research that other people did. So th this is there's something a little bit strange here in that he doesn't sort of pick up on this, that that's just not the sort of thing you do in that sort of context. I mean, you want, you know, proper apologetics. There's, you know, tons. Um, anyhow, the, uh, so, so that said, um, it, uh, oh, and then the, uh, the, the relevant part though, is that it is relatively straightforward to argue for how much, you know, how valuable religion is to morality. That's the sort of thing you can do without recourse to studies, because that is more open to debate and discussion just by the very nature of it. That's more a matter of here are principles, here are things about human beings that we all know, and here's how things follow. You can make that sort of argument without recourse to reference material. You, you can't prove, you know, especially historical things without reference, recourse to reference materials. So there's a major asymmetry there that really explains this. I, he shouldn't be surprised. Rather, it's, it's the usefulness of religion, especially as a, a framework in which to think about morality, uh, that people uh, uh, are uh, willing to advocate for, uh, and the commensurate danger of, of atheism, that atheism is somehow corrosive of, of morality. Uh, now, the first thing to notice is that as, a, as an argument for belief in God, that is it's not only a bad argument, that's actually a, a non sequitur. I mean, now, I have no doubt that it is a poorly phrased argument, but whether it is a bad argument actually depends quite a lot on what precisely it is. Um, now, this is useful, therefore believe in it, is not in itself a good argument. However, and this is the thing, and by the way, I'm not supporting an argument I particularly like to make. I'm just saying, you know, uh, with the principle of charity, give people their due and, you know, figure out what argument they're actually making. It all depends on what you take to be the most certain things. Because, you know, an argument always has premises, but what are your premises? There, there's this idea in the, uh, what we often call the Enlightenment, that your premises should be based, you know, uh, well, Descartes started off with, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, and reason from there. And it had a lot of influence on people that, your premises should have something to do either starting from your own existence or mathematical principles or, you know, basic sensory data. Um, but that, that's only one approach and it actually doesn't work very well. By contrast, a lot of people find things like, you know, uh, what is good is vastly more certain to them than all sorts of other things. You know, for example, that, that some sort of morally abhorrent act is morally abhorrent is one of the things they are most certain of in life. Now, this is in no sense what people would often call properly basic or something like that. It's not the sort of thing at all that the Enlightenment philosophers would regard. But that being said, whatever a person is most certain of is actually the best starting point for them in an argument. Certainly it is the best starting point to an, to for arguments to make to them. Um, so... In that case, uh, if you start from something less certain, then if it contradicts things that are more certain to them, they'll just figure there's some error in what you said somewhere, I don't know where. If you start from what is most certain to them and work from there, they're much more likely to accept it. And moreover, this is often how people themselves reason, starting from what they find to be the most reliable thing. It actually makes a great deal of sense to do so. For a lot of people, the everyday things of their experience are far more certain to them than all sorts of esoteric things that they've never really looked into. And therefore, societal you know, a well-ordered society in which human beings are happy in the manner that one is used to them being happy, if that that thing that I just described is the thing to which, uh, which is most certain to a person, and for an awful lot of people it is, then starting from there actually makes a lot of sense, um, even though it is not, you know, a good scientific starting point, it's not where Enlightenment philosophers would start. However, 
if you want to convince people, you need to start from what they actually take to be most certain. And uh, by the way, one should not by any means privilege the Enlightenment era starting point. It was one sort of odd thing that went nowhere and produced, you know, first modern philosophy, which was a, a disaster. And then postmodern philosophy, which made modern philosophy <laughs> look rather well done. So uh, it's not a, a, a good thing to privilege by any means, or at least it's by no means obvious that it should be privileged. So as to whether or not this is a good argument, basically it depends on what your starting point is. If your starting point is an Enlightenment era thing, then obviously it's a terrible argument. If your starting point is about the good of a well-ordered society in which its members are happy, it's actually a fairly reasonable starting point that that thing, which is obviously good, depends upon something else, therefore that other thing must be true. Not, um... I should say because it would be convenient, but rather because the thing which is most clearly true, the most certain thing to a person, is the good of that well-ordered society. And you can complain all day long about that not being a properly basic belief, but whatever a person is most certain of is going to most naturally be their starting point in their reasoning. So this is a perfectly good argument if that is the thing that a person is most convinced of. And I just would like to note that a lot of people who claim that this is a bad way to reason have that basic thing as their most certain starting point as well. They just don't admit the necessity of certain things to that well-ordered society in which people are happy. So while I don't like that argument, I don't make that argument, the societal good argument. For that matter, the societal good being you know, good is not, to me personally, a particularly clear thing. I get there by way of argumentation from other places. Um, it's, it's a derived good, as I personally perceive it. So I don't like that argument at all. But for an awful lot of people, that actually is the clearest thing, and therefore the most natural starting point. So, uh, and, and oh, to add one thing to that too. When you start there, what you tend to get is, even if you are mistaken about the truth of something that enables that good, you're not very far off from the truth, because whatever does happen to be true is going to be something relatively similar that allows for the good previously mentioned. Um, it, it tends to be how people reason about this sort of thing. Uh, another way to put it is people don't really care all that much about the particulars of what they don't understand anyway. Um, and, and so that's how they tend to approach this. So whatever the details of the thing are, they don't really care very much. In the same way that most people believe that science is a pretty good way of getting at truths about the natural world, but no, almost no science, and don't really care. I mean, how many people who believe that, they, that there are things called atoms that are made up of protons and neutrons and electrons actually know you know, what these things are even supposed to be, or even, you know, know what the wave particle duality is. And moreover, how many of these people have any idea how you would go about doing something like measuring the electrical charge of an electron? I described this in a previous video, like an oil drop experiment. It's big and complicated. It's hard to do. Most people have no idea how to do it and they don't care. So in the same way that they don't care about that, they tend not to care that much about the details of theology. Um, that, that can, you know, I, I'm Catholic, so they should, to a degree. Um, and what works much better is where you have people who do and that are then trustable. Because uh, the details can actually matter. But in any event, this is how most people reason, not only about um, not, not only about religion, but also about you know, things like science and so on. So, uh, just to say, in one sense, yes, this is an argument I like either. So in a sense, I'm very sympathetic with Sam here. Uh, but on the other hand, to say that it's a non sequitur is rather to mistake what is being said. Religion could be useful, but completely empty of, of uh, content. Uh, it could function like a placebo. Uh, and beliefs, really, you can't, you can't believe something or shouldn't be able to believe something merely based on its utility. Oh, a uh, quick thing about placebos. The fact that a placebo has no ordinary uh, drug effect... It, that has has no direct drug pathways, um, like, like the sort of drugs the FDA approves, is actually entirely irrelevant to the practice of medicine. Now, if you happen to to be within the sort of context where you believe the placebo isn't going to do anything, um, and, and that, that you have to lie to a person, you, you do run into some ethical problems. But if you have a substance, which if you give to a person and they get better... 
that is an effective medicine in a practical sense, despite the fact that it didn't do anything in the sense of have a direct pathway you can explain a, a causal link between the taking of the thing and, and the effect. Because most people live their lives as human beings, not as, you know, sort of introspective biology textbooks. So the particular mechanism of action of a placebo is actually is irrelevant. All that really matters to most people is whether or not it in fact makes you better. And that's all that actually matters to medicine. It's a big, long, complicated subject I'm not going to get into. But the funny thing is that placebos actually work. I mean, in double-blind trials, you know, controlled double-blinded studies, placebos actually do work. Um, it, it varies a lot with, with what, but, you know, placebos work at least as well, for example, as a lot of um, antidepressants uh, with far fewer side effects than uh, the antidepressants, which are, are drugs that have definite pathways and consequently definite predictable side effects. Um, so it, it's a weird sort of thing, but in any event, it's just something worth bearing in mind that calling something a placebo doesn't mean that it's ineffective. It only means that it does not have a particular mechanism of action that you are looking for as a particular type of, of, of biomedical researcher. Uh, beliefs are not like clothing. You can't adopt them on the basis of, of uh, comfort or utility. Um, oh, I'd, I'd also like to point out that in a sense he's right um, in, in that one should value the truth. On the other hand, um, an awful lot of people adopt beliefs on the basis of utility. Um, and this is incredibly true, incidentally, of secularists. So, as I said, that was the introduction he gave to his talk. Part two will be about the actual substance of forming a scientific morality. So that's really the meat of it. But his intro had a bunch of things that I think were worth addressing on their own, even if they're not particularly related or directly related to the topic at hand. So, um, as I said, I'm breaking this up now. So this is the end of part one. Part two will come out soon where I talk about, you know, the actual talk that he gave in scientific morality. So... Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.